I think one of the first questions we're going to be asking is um, you know, whether threat intelligence is actually necessary or attribution is necessary. Uh, you know, does it make any difference if we know who's attacking us? $10 billion, by far the biggest cyber attack in history. Within 15 minutes, the, the entire environment was taken down. The thing that really amazed me were how many corollaries were being drawn from the military. I've worked very, very closely with CISOs over the last two, three years, and the challenges they face are amazing. We kind of just touched the surface. There is so much more to this conversation. One of the benefits of threat intelligence is for organizations to be intelligence-led. So they have up-to-date information on what their technology estate is doing in relation to information and cybersecurity. One of those things can relate quite easily back to the Petia ransomware attacks in 2016, where people sort of stood up services to take better control of what their organizations were monitoring and how. Not, not Petia or ex-Petia came really on the heels of WannaCry. So WannaCry hit globally um, about May 2017. It was a ransomware. Obviously it made global media coverage, certainly in the UK, WannaCry, because of its effectiveness of hitting public sector, NHS and, and local government. So we were still reeling from WannaCry. We were still trying to understand as an, as an industry, as a population, kind of how it got in, what its processes were, how can we defend against it, and then Expetra came around. I'm not sure if you knew about the, the how not Petra spread. It spread from Ukraine, uh, attacking a, a company called Medoc, which is basically the finance uh, accounting software you have to use in Ukraine. Every organised multinational has to use it. Expetra was utilising the same vulnerabilities for initial intrusion onto um, a victim's machine, which was used by WannaCry. So what we call internal blue, internal romance vulnerabilities. And that allowed them to gain access, remote code injection, gain access to the, to the user's devices. Every infected computer carried the same message. If you see this text, it said, your files are no longer accessible because they've been encrypted. The message then demands payment to recover the data. What Xpeta was, was a, what we thought at the time actually was, was another ransomware attack. And the reason it's called Xpetra is because it mirrored in its initial behavior very closely to a known ransomware family called Petra. And what Petra was, was a ransomware attack that rather than encrypting individual files, would encrypt the file table. And what essentially that means in layman's terms is if you had a, a box full of Lego bricks, a, a standard file-based encryptor would try to deny you access to each individual Lego brick. What Petra was doing was trying to deny you access to the box with all the Lego inside it. It's a lot harder to do, it requires a lot more technical capabilities, it has to work on a very low level, and the success rate is, is a lot smaller than a file-based encryptor. So we initially thought X Petra was something very similar. What it actually turned out is that it did in fact encrypt the files, but it had no method to reverse that encryption. So it became more of a wiper or a destructor. So it was, it was destroying data. How quickly Instagram Merck as Pharma and Merck as a Danish fish shipping, it hit a lot of multinationals around the world. It was collateral damage. That, that was it. It was basically, they weren't the targeted recipients. They were Ukrainian infrastructure that's targeted recipients. They were collateral damage. But within 15 minutes, they, their entire environment was taken down. And it was just mind blowing how quickly it happened because of the way everything's interconnected and, and works together. So it, it was eye opening in terms of something like that, the way that they hacked into into a, a third party product, a finance accounting software that everybody has to run, and then that then launched the attack. And we saw huge, obviously, numbers being spoken about, and some organizations hitting 500 million in losses. And um, obviously, and we saw Maersk take a lot of the media coverage, but that's less so because they were the most hit, but because the story was so fantastic. They pretty much were, all their machines were dropping and going black and black and black, and uh, luckily for them, which pretty much saved them, they had two servers, backup servers in, in Africa, and they were having technical issues, those servers, and they were offline. If those servers were online, they would have lost everything. 
because those sewers are offline, they didn't get infected with the with the Xpetya. They were they were then flew two people separately on separate planes with USB sticks to back up that data. They then had to restore. I think they restored about forty thousand workstations in ten days. So they did an incredible job of returning themselves back to business to, to their business functionality. But you know, they're by by no means the the, the most financially damaging um, victim of of Xpetya. Has it changed stuff long term? I think now, what are we, three years after the incident? Probably not. I think this year um, has shown that, I think, quite a lot in the, the success ratings of ransomware families like Maze. I mean, they're in, the, they're in the media pretty much every week, taking down large organisations like EasyJet and Garmin and Travelex. And these are big organisations that should have large cybersecurity budgets and SOC teams, up, and they're still successful. And they're still using vulnerabilities to be successful in their intrusion onto the network. So is it addressing the issue slowly? But we're not there yet. Certainly not in the UK. I think other regions are a bit more further ahead in threat intelligence and implementation. In the UK, we're still, we're still in its infancy for the vast majority of organisations.